Okay, the reading for this week is a piece by the great 20th century writer Nagai Kafu. It's called Fukagawa no Uta. And the translation I'll be reading is, uh, by, is a brilliant translation by Professor Timothy Goddard. And his translation and the original Japanese will be included in my forthcoming book, Modern Japanese Literature, a Bilingual Reader, uh, which will be published by my university press, uh, Nagawa University of Foreign Studies Press. And the book is intended to be a uh, reader, a bilingual reader, to be used in uh, undergraduate Japanese culture, language, and literature classes around the world. And in this video, I'll be uh, doing a recitation of uh, Professor Goddard's uh, brilliant translation. And uh, we will discuss the work further in class. And before I read the work, um, let me say that I did a, a recitation the other day and I forgot to put the mic cap on the microphone. So it was very hard to hear. So I'm redoing it here. And I'm going to try to make it as, uh, a little bit shorter than that last video, which took a bit too long. So I'll read this work as quickly as possible with as little uh, commentary as possible. Uh, hopefully no commentary. And uh, we'll discuss it more in detail. At the end of the work in the... Um, uh, in my bilingual reader, there is a there are six study questions uh, that students will want to can keep in the back of their heads as they read through the work, and we'll discuss it in class. Here are the study questions. Question number one: What does the opening paragraph tell you about the narrator? What kind of person is he? Okay, so he's a kind of roving narrator that doesn't refer to himself much. He's kind of a like a, a camera that kind of uh, roves about the train and then uh, through the Fukagawa area. And um, we don't get much direct information about him, but there are little hints given along the way. Uh, we learn about his personality, his character, from the things that he observes, from the things that he is drawn to, from the, uh, uh, the objects and figures that uh, draw his attention and so forth. What kind of person is he is question number one. Question number two, what kind of people, what types of people does the narrator see on the streetcar? What does he think of them? Okay, so keep in mind that this is a work that moves from the Yamanote region of uh, the sort of center of modern uh, Tokyo in 1909, I think is the year of this work. And it moves back in time, as it were, kind of metaphorically back in time as he moves toward the Shitamachi area of uh, Tokyo, which is the area around the Sumida River, which was the center of the old culture of the Edo period, which was uh, lasted from 1600 to 1863, as you will remember. And by the way, I'll put the dates of the major eras uh, in the description below this video, as I always do. Uh, but just keep in mind that the Edo period lasts from 1600 to 1868 and is followed by the Meiji period. And it's in the late years, the final years of the Meiji period that he wrote this work. Right? And the Meiji period ends in 1912 and then you get the Taisho period. After that, Showa period starts in 1926 and lasts all the way to 1989. All right, so this is, um, so he's moving kind of metaphorically back in time out of the modernity, which he hates, and which he rejects, right, of uh, the Meiji mod modernity, the Bum Mei Kaika, civilization, enlightenment, that he moves away from, and he moves toward this uh, idyllic uh, past of the Edo period that is still represented, still uh, traces of it linger and remain in this area around the Sumidagawa River, uh, per in particular the Fukagawa area that he visits in this story. All right, what does he think of them? That's question number two. Question number three, what significance does Fukagawa hold for the narrator? Why does he go there? Okay, so this is a description. Uh, to answer this question, you want to describe the place and what does Fukagawa represent in his mind, right? Uh, what sort of world does it represent? Question number four, what draws the narrator to the blind man playing the shamisen? So when he gets to Fukagawa, he encounters a blind man playing the shamisen. What does this man represent? What draws the narrator to him? Question number five, even as he writes of his desire to linger in Fukagawa, he wants to stay there forever, the narrator acknowledges that he must return to his home in a different part of the city, in the uh, Yamanote area, right, where he lives now, I think, uh, possibly uh, Ropongi area, actually, but um, he doesn't live in the old part of the city anymore, which is what is important. Why must he go back, right? And the part that he lives in now is kind of the, the westernized part, right? And keep in mind as we read this that uh, Tokyo's uh, sort of uh, westernization and modernization process uh, took several decades, right? But um, in 1923, we have the great the, uh, Daito, uh, the Daikanto Jishin, right? The great Kanto uh, earthquake of 1923, which destroys the whole city. And after that, uh, pretty much n no traces of the old Edo period uh, culture and the, uh, the old Edo city uh, remnants are all destroyed. And after that, we have a completely westernized city, right? So 
at the time that he's writing the story, there are still traces of uh, the old Edo culture and the Edo, Edo city that he seeks and he visits these places. But by 1923, it will become impossible to do this kind of uh, uh, time travel voyage, right? Okay, now on to the um, work. Before I do that, though, actually, uh, question number six is about uh, Tao, the connection between this work and Tao Yuan Ming's Peach Blossom Spring, which is an essay from the early 15th century, a kind of story essay that we read uh, already in this class. And it's a very famous essay, very influential in Japanese culture, about a guy who leaves the present and goes into, he discovers this uh, world that exists outside of time, this sort of utopian space that is very different than the uh, fraught, um, war-torn uh, reality that he lives in. And he discovers this world and he lives there for a day or so. And then he leaves it and he wants to return at some point. So he drops uh, little uh, signs along the way or little seeds or something. I forget what he drops, but um, he intends to go back there at some point, but he's unable to find it ever again. And he uh, enlists the help of several other people to uh, look for the place, but they never find it. And uh, it just sort of lingers in the back of his head for the rest of his life um, as this utopian space, right? And that, I think that original story by Tao Yuan Ming in the fifth century kind of informs Nagai Kafu. And Nagai Kafu, of course, was certainly uh, familiar with that story. So the sixth question is compare this story with, Naga, with uh, Tao Yuan Ming's uh, story of the Peach Blossom Spring and uh, note any similarities that you can find. All right, it's the end of the introduction and the study questions. Now I will recite the entire piece right, as quickly as possible so that I am able to take my daughter to the kindergarten in time. We have about 40 minutes to get through this. Okay, Nagai Kafe, we'll discuss more about the author in detail. 1879, he was born, so that's what, Meiji, it, uh, Meiji 12, and he died in 1959, so after the war in uh, year 34 of the Showa period, right? He was a novelist, a play playwright, an essayist, and diarist, and I should note that um, for better or worse, it is Nagai Kafe who probably had the, the most profound impact on me when I was a young man in my 20s and 30s for better or worse, uh, both literarily and uh, sort of in terms of uh, personal life. His works are noted for their depictions of life in 20th century Tokyo, especially the world of geisha and prostitutes, cabaret dancers, and other denizens of the city's lively entertainment districts. Okay, so the demimonde. He's a poet or a writer of the demimonde, whether he's in Paris. He lived in Paris for a while, and he was very influenced by the demimonde world there. And when he was in America, he frequented the brothel areas in Seattle and other places. And he's very drawn to that uh, sort of world of the demi monde. Among his major works are America Monogatai, which is American stories, kind of travel log of his experiences in America, 1908, that was published. Uh, Ude Kurdabe, uh, translated as Geisha in Rivalry, uh, which was serialized between 1916 and 17. Uh, and his masterpiece, Bokuto Kidan which I first read, I think, in a Kokobunga class at Waseda University. And this was translated by Seidensteger, I think, um, or maybe someone else. After the, I think it was Seidensteger. Uh, this was published in 1937 in the original. And perhaps we'll read that at some point. It's a great sort of metafictional work that's very influenced by André Gide and uh, has all kinds of experimental narrative techniques used in it. And his diaries, especially Dancho Te Nichijo, which uh, he started early on. Uh, when he was a young man in 1917 and continued writing this diary all the way to 1959. And it was uh, published in several volumes. You can buy it. Um, I don't think it's been translated, though. Okay, here is the story now. Make sure I'm still recording. Yes, all good. All right. And keep in mind that um, as we read this, Nagai Kafu is uh, often described as an elegist for... Um, a sort of nostalgic writer who longs for the past. And that's all true and whatnot. He is an elegist for the past and this idealized world of the Edo period. And, but it's done so as a critique of modernity, right? So the sort of implicit target of all of his writings is modernity itself. And he's, uh, so we can read him as a bumme uh, hihan. Bumme hihan is sort of a criticism of uh, civilization, of modern Western civilization, right? So this piece, it's divided into two sections. The first section, he's on the train, and he's moving slowly away from the center of the modern city uh, toward the old city and uh, Fukaga. And, if, and the second part of the story is uh, he gets off in that area and walks around Fukaga, and then eventually is uh, obliged to return to reality, to the modern world, in the final paragraph. All right. Uh, 
section one, as quickly as possible, no commentary. I boarded a streetcar from Yotsuya, and underline all these names that come up, right, in the city. These are all important areas of Tokyo, important stations, a train station. Yotsuya is next to Sophia University, where I used to teach and uh, where I did my MA a long time ago. Uh, I boarded a streetcar from Yotsuya Mitsuke bound for Tsukiji Ryogoka. So Tsukiji Ryogoka is near the Sumida River. So as you identify these places, note whether they're in the Yamanote area, the sort of high city where the bourgeois live and the uh, Meiji oligarchs and the uh, Meiji bureaucrats and so forth, or the old part of the city where the uh, shoming and the merchants and the uh, shoning and so forth still live. I boarded a streetcar from Yotsuya Mitsuke bound for Tsukiji Ryogoka, Ryogoku is where the sumo matches are held today. I wasn't going anywhere in particular. It's just that I derive a certain pleasure from having my body jostled about while riding, riding on a moving vehicle, whether a boat or a car. I don't know when this particular peculiar habit of mine developed, if it was on the elevated trains in New York, the top decks of omnibuses in Paris, or the river bank boats on the Seine. Okay, so it's clear here that he's already been abroad. He doesn't know when he developed this habit, whether it was when he was in New York or Paris or the Seine River. The weather was fine. So we know that he's uh, kind of a, um, somebody who's born in, probably into a wealthy class because he's able to uh, travel abroad. Very few people in the major period were able to travel abroad. So we know something about him and he's probably more educated than all the people that he uh, observes and describes in this story. The weather was fine. It was warm and there was no wind. Already 20 days had passed in the month of December, and New Year's decorations of pine and bamboo, round red lanterns, curtains, large paper lanterns on poles, and all manner of flags and banners formed a contrast between the dirty tile roofs and the fresh wood planks of the newly built houses along the main avenue in Kojimachi. Underline Kojimachi. This is near Yotsuya, this is near Sophia University, uh, where all the uh, embassies, foreign embassies are held and so forth, where the streetcar ran. The bright mid-afternoon sun shone down mercilessly on this chaotic scene, which was devoid of the slightest hint of harmony. Okay, there's it's chaos. There's no harmony here. Uh, most of the descriptions in this first part of the story are negative, right? He doesn't see much that, that attracts him, that he finds uh, refined or beautiful or elegant, right? For ref refinement, elegance, beauty, he must go to the old part of the city, the Fukagawa area. Here and there, out-of-tune advertising bands belted out their songs, and the throng of pedestrians was extremely tense. There's a throng of pedestrians, a mob, flags, all the things that he doesn't like about uh, modern life described there in that first uh, few paragraphs. The interior of the streetcar, so now he's inside the streetcar, however, was unexpectedly empty. There was just one man in a yellow army uniform. Okay, so underline all the people that appear in this uh, car as he's observing. This is the first person, the man in the yellow army uniform, who appeared to be a captain. Two other soldiers shrinking in the corner. Another man with the appearance of a contractor who sat with a briefcase resting on his knees. Three merchants who might have been bill collectors. Two female students. And a woman who looked like an old geisha from Shinjuku or Yotsuya. So underline Shinjuku, Yono, Shinjuku and Yotsuya, which is near about a 20-minute walk from Shinjuku. The sunlight came streaming in through the window, shining directly onto the grimy, unshaven face of the captain. Every hair, hair on his face shone like a needle. So this kind of thread of violence uh, is, is here in his face, right? Shone like a needle. Uh, the gaudy pompadours of the female students were discolored, as dirty as grease-soaked trash that one couldn't bear to look at for a second time. So grease soaked, trashy, dirty. These are all the images and associations that have, uh, he describes when he's in this new part of the city. All of us were silent with our lips half open, looking into each other's faces with eyes that had nowhere else to go. So alienation, no communication between the humans. This is the essence of the modern world, is what he seems to be saying here. Some looked down at the row of geta and shoes on the passenger's feet, not even a lottery advertisement for tens of thousands of yen could draw away people's gazes. The old geisha twisted her pale, thin lips, sucking loudly on a cavity. He's discussing uh, images in old geisha in contrast to the beautiful woman that we will see in uh, Fukagawa. Right? The old geisha twisted her pain, pale, thin lips, sucking loudly on a cavity. After yawning loudly, the contractor 
let out a belch. From time to time, the conductor twisted his body around to pull back the rope behind him that kept getting dislodged. Yeah, the conductor appears several times to so underline the conductor. He's from the uh, provinces, speaks in this provincial accent. Um, at Kozima, he's definitely not an Edoko. He's not somebody from uh, the city of Edo or from his, his lineage, doesn't come from Edo, it's from the uh, provinces. Uh, at Kozimachi Sanchome, so street three of Kozimachi, an ugly woman of about 40, so another ugly middle aged woman. woman right? Middle aged women are usually uh, described in negative terms in uh, Nagai Kafa's work. An ugly woman of about 40 got on holding a hanging lantern and a parcel wrapped in a white cotton cloth and carrying her baby in a shawl, along with two teenagers who were carrying baseball equipment, so these Western uh, modes of uh, Western sports that they're engaged in. The teenagers spoke in raptures about their grades on the final exam that had taken place the day before. Suddenly, the baby let out a piercing cry, and the sound of a geisha chewing on her tooth was no longer audible. The passengers all looked at the face of the crying baby. The woman unfastened the string of her shawl took the baby in her arms and undoing her grimy collar, suckled it on her breast. Okay, notice that um, this could be a third person narrator, right? Because we don't have uh, any direct references to himself. It's a first person narrator, of course, but it's as if uh, he doesn't really exist. He's just a roving camera moving through the uh, car. Suckled it on her breast. Just when I thought the baby would stop crying, the conductor announced, Hanzo Mon, Hanzo Mon, passengers traveling in the direction of Kudang, Ichigaya, Kongo, Kanda, Koishikawa, please transfer here. So this is the area around uh, between Tokyo University, University of Tokyo, Todai, uh, which is in Hongo, and uh, Koishikawa, which is in the Ikebukuro area. Please transfer here. You're uh, transferring to Koishikawa. Please hurry up. Her dark breast dangling. So her dark breast means she's probably not from uh, Edo either, right? She's from the, uh, the west of Japan. The woman rushed to get off with one hand on her baby and one hand on her lantern and parcel. When they, got, when they caught sight of the unexpectedly empty car, the passengers who had been waiting fought their way forward, pushing the woman who was trying to get off and occupying the seats without the slightest concern for one another. Uh, under, or write down the word Rishin Shuse. This is an important word in the context of Meiji Japan. During uh, the Edo period, you have the strict uh, social uh, hierarchy, right? The class structure of the Shi no Ko Sho with the samurai on top, the Shi followed by the peasants, theoretically at least, uh, the farmers, uh, followed by the uh, artisans, the coal, and then the merchants, who were supposed to be on the bottom, but eventually rose, over, rose to the top in uh, the second half of the Edo period, the Sho. That's the class structure that was abolished in the Meiji period, so that you had um, people from any class, born in any class, striving to get to the top, right, in this new capitalist environment. And this is Rishin uh, Shuse, literally means... Uh, pulling oneself up and making it in the world or something like that, right? So you see people on the uh, train even. This is expressed or embodied in the people on the train who are fighting to get the uh, best position, pushing, one, pushing each other to the ground, uh, a very competitive environment, which is a kind of microcosm for uh, Meiji Japan as a whole, okay? Um, Pushing the woman who's trying to get off and occupying the seats without the slightest concern for one another. So people no longer care about each other. Uh, there's no more ren, to use the Chinese Confucian term, right? Uh, no more um, <coughs> humaneness, jin in Japanese. Uh, no more Confucian values. Confucian virtues, Confucian values are all thrown out the window in this new Meiji world. The baby began to scream and its diaper slipped off. The passengers tried to advance, heedlessly trampling on the diaper. And at this, the woman let out a desperate cry. In a shrill voice, the conductor warned her with the stock phrase, take care not to leave anything behind. Okay, so he just, It's kind of a robot, this conductor. He just says the same things over and over, regardless of what's happening in front of him, while eyeing the dirty diaper. Now there's a diaper on the floor, a dirty diaper, shit spilling on the floor. The woman had no choice but to abandon it, and the conductor could only say, for your safety, please don't rush. Finally, the bell rang out. We are now departing. No sooner had the conductor spoken than the streetcar with a loud clang started to move. A grayish old woman who was standing after having missed her chance at grabbing a seat and a young woman of 18 or 19 with an Icho Gaishi hairstyle. Underline all the hairstyles that appear in this work. These hairstyles are indicators of what status the woman belongs to, what class she belongs to, whether she's a, a rising bourgeoisie or a working girl or an old sort of geisha, uh, old style geisha and so forth. So 
Ichio Gaishi will review that in class, that hairstyle. And wearing an apron, who appeared to be her daughter, grabbed onto a hand strap together just when it looked like they would fall. Just then, someone's foot was stepped on, and he let out a cry. <clears throat> so people were stepping on each other. Ow, that hurts. It was a worker dressed in an overcoat and trousers. Oh, I'm terribly sorry, said the woman with the Ichio Gaishi. She blushed a deep red and bent over to apologize. But then she stumbled again at the swaying of the streetcar. So there's some humaneness and politeness occurring here in, in the car. Ah, I'm scared. Please sit down, miss. A gentleman in an Inverness coat. Okay, so he's probably a wealthy uh, bourgeois gentleman in an Inverness coat with a faint mustache, Western-style man, graciously yielded his seat. So the ideal sort of Meiji man. Uh, thank you so much. But the one who sat down was the grayish old woman who looked like her mother. The young woman, stretching out her hand almost on her tiptoes, gripped the strap tightly. The length of her underarm was visible through her cuff. Constantly mindful of this fact, she kept pulling at her light woolen undershirt. The streetcar ran peacefully down a gentle hill. The worker, whose foot had been stepped on earlier, suddenly started to snore. Someone began reading aloud from the newspaper. Okay, so things have calmed down a bit on the train. We passed the stop at Miyakezaka without any commotion. The streetcar ran alongside an embankment beneath a row of bumpy, withered willow trees. On the right side, several wagons rested beneath an old tree that was in perpetual summer like verdure. A box-shaped carriage drawn by two horses pursued the streetcar. On the left side, the view of the moat appeared like a painting through the streetcar window. The tall embankment, crowned with a stone wall and luxurious pines, came in and out before sloping gently down into the water. As I looked out over the curve of the bank, this spot was set off with an astonishing vividness illuminated by the light of the sun. Like a mirror, the surface of the blue, murky water reflected everything clearly, from the weeds that covered both sides of the embankment, every single branch of the willow trees, and all the way up to the clouds floating high in the sky. Underline all, all water imagery that appears in this work whenever you see it. This is uh, very important. Water, uh, the city of Edo, of course, was a city of water, much like Venice was. And most of that water and these canals and little... Uh, uh, the offshoots of the um, Sumida River uh, eventually disappeared uh, in the 1910s, 1920s, 1930s, but uh, traces of this old watery world of Edo remain in 1909 when he's writing this, and they're very important for uh, Nagai Kafu's narrative. And all the way up to the clouds floating high in the sky, scores of waterfowl flew in unceasingly, clustering along the embankment, their flapping broken with a splash. This natural nature imagery is very important. We'll discuss its uh, significance and function and meaning in class. The streetcar turned along the bank. The waters of the canal were e ever more broadly visible and ever more tranquil. The white wall of the Sakurada gate standing at the edge, faintly covered by the slightly murky light of the sun before evening, was reflected so vividly on the water that it was impossible to distinguish the reflection from the real thing. So lots of reflections uh, in the water. Sumi passed by the outside of Hibiya Park, underlying Hibiya Park, this Hibiya Koen, uh, which is right near the Ginza. The streetcar moved across the wide boulevard, and two or three men hopped off without waiting for the streetcar to arrive at the narrow street on the opposite side. Please wait until the car has stopped moving before getting off, said the conductor. No sooner had he said this than someone fell down. After assuring himself that the man had suffered no serious injury, the conductor pulled back the disconnected rope with all his might. The streetcar rattled along, along the multi-layered road. When it arrived at the designated stop, a crowd of people was waiting. Among them were two or three merchants carrying large packages on their back, backs. The usual commotion of people getting on and off. In a shrill voice, the conductor said, Please move to the middle of the car. You there, I beg your pardon, but would you mind... Uh, just taking the next strap down. It's very crowded, so please take care of your belongings. The streetcar is moving. Transferring passengers, please have your tickets for out for inspection. Next stop, Skia Bayashi. Are there any passengers transferring here? Yes, just a minute. I'm transferring. There's a transfer to Honjo, right? An old woman immediately called out. She had her hair cut short and looked like a retiree. But the conductor was preoccupied with clap clipping the passengers' tickets as he made his way for, from the corner. 
a round trip ticket, your change is one cent from a 10 cent silver coin. You won't be transferring? Hey, I'm transferring, shrieked the old woman bound for Honjo as if she were being strangled. Hey there, a book of tickets, 30 please, said a man in a hunting cap with his twin striped hem tucked in, handing two one yen notes to the conductor. He wore long wool socks and high laced boots and he looked like he might be a sales clerk at a bicycle shop. As the conductor took the notes, he glanced over and hurriedly made the preliminary announcement for the streetcar to stop at Skiabashi. Even, uh, even as the streetcar came to Owaricho, the sales clerk still hadn't received the, his book of tickets, so now it was his turn to worry instead of the old woman. Yet all the same, he did not raise his voice, but just stared simply at the conductor without blinking. Through the glass windows of the streetcar, rows of modest, utilitarian, western-style houses appeared on either side of the street, like something one would see in the colonies of India or southern China. So now that he's making this connection between the colonized, uh, the colonized countries of India and China to uh, his own Japan right here. And he's used the word utilitarian, which is uh, in contrast to the beauty of the old Edo, right? Just uh, its use function is all that matters these days and uh, exchange value and so forth. The sound of streetcars suddenly became intense. Another out-of-tune band could be heard. In other words, we are out-of-tune band, so uh, aesthetic value is not important to these people, is the implication here, right? Beauty is no longer a concern to the Japanese, is the uh, implicit critique here. And you see that same kind of implicit critique in a lot of the works of, uh, Naga, of Tanizaki Jirinjiro, who made his debut work, Shisei or the Tattooer, uh, this same year, I think, 1909. Right? And it's a very similar kind of work where it... Uh, extols uh, the past Edo, world of Edo, uh, and implicitly contrasts that beautiful world with uh, the ugly uh, utilitarian present. An out of tune band could be heard. In other words, we are crossing the main boulevard in Ginza. So they're in the Ginza now. We'll discuss the meaning of Ginza in class. Mixed in with the passengers were three country bumpkins wearing straw sandals and sedge weaved hats. And again, there was great congestion. So during the Edo period, it was not very common to see a country bumpkin, somebody from the provinces, in the city. Well, there, there were some, but not like there were in uh, Tokyo in 1909. A, huge, a large percentage of the Tokyo population this time was not from Tokyo, and they'd come in from the provinces right, for, in search of work and so forth. Uh, there was great congestion. At the rear exit, the passengers jostled so much it was even hard to breathe, and they cursed as though a fight would break out at any moment. The kind of vulgar, rough types. Move to the sides, please. It's very crowded. All kinds of hands hung on, leaving not a single strap unoccupied. Next to a graceful white hand with a sparkling ring, a thick thumbnail stood out like a horse's hoof. The sleeve of a grimy cotton flannel shirt was right next to some gold cuff links. Requests for transfer tickets, the panic of the bumpkins, at times the gentle voice of a woman from the low city. Underline low city is the translation of shtamachi the area, the old center of, uh, of the city of Edo, around the Sumida, Sumida River area. Uh, the gentle voice of a woman from the low city could be heard intermingled with the clamor in the streetcar that was so loud it made one's head hurt. So note that her voice is described as gentle, right? So things that are from the low city, from the Shitamachi, are described in positive terms in all of the Nagaikata's work in, as a general rule. When we stopped at the riverbank in Kobikicho, so they're getting closer now to the Sumida River, there was word that someone had mixed in with the crowd to steal a ride. And the conductor pursued a man with a fedora and a handbag all the way to the entrance of an alley. The conductor of the next streetcar to join, to stop, joined him in support. And when they returned, a crowd of onlookers had gathered in excitement. Some people on the streetcar even left their seats and went to the exit to have a look. Don't be so stingy. Let's go already. This is a real pain for everyone who paid fairly, someone yelled. Somebody's trying to hitch a ride for free. Uh, taking advantage of the unexpected stop, several people hurried to get on. The last person was a woman so beautiful. Okay, finally, a uh, beautiful woman who captures the attention of the uh, narrator, of this flaneur narrator. We, I didn't mention the flaneur, but uh, a lot of Nagai Kafu's uh, narrator protagonists in his novels are like these kind of French uh, Baudelaire type flaneur figures who kind of wander around the city and observe things and are uh, drawn by 
attracted to uh, beautiful women such as this one who just appeared here. The last person was a woman so beautiful that she drew the attention of everyone in the car for a moment. She was 22 or 23 and she wore her hair in a chignon with a red hair tie. From the sleeves of her olive covered colored Azuma coat she had aligned the red two layered pockets of her kimono and in one hand she carried a small silk wrapped parcel that might have been a gift box of cakes. She told, took hold of a strap near the exit. Oh, is that you, Yoshiko? Ex exclaimed the woman sitting below her. She was of the same age with a chignon in the same style. Oh, my! The standing woman in the chignon broke off her speech in apparent astonishment at the random encounter. It's been five years, Yoshiko, maybe more. Indeed. <clears throat> it was, yes, it was uh, that time when I saw you last at the class reunion at Fujimura's house. The street car finally began to move. Yoshiko, please come to see me. I'm counting on you, said the seated woman with the chignon. She was suddenly pushed to the left of the bench, which seemed to be packed quite tightly. A doddering old geezer who looked like a moneylender was also crammed onto the bench. He wore a scarf, and out of the corner of his eye, he glared with dissatisfaction at the woman's white neck. So he's not amused by this beautiful woman and her uh, erotic neck. <clears throat> Without uttering a complaint, though, he carefully gathered the cape of his old-fashioned long coat and got up from his seat. The woman with the red hair tie sat down in turn, placing the parcel on her lap. So this is unthinkable today. Nobody stands up and offers their seat to a young woman. It, it happens on occasion on, on a Tokyo train for an, old, uh, an elderly person, but uh, generally not for uh, women. What's going on with the alumni association anyway? Association anyway, she said. Recently, no one at all has come to collect the dues. Fujimura is very busy, that's for certain. It's all because of that shop, you know. I hope that your husband and the rest of your family are doing well. Oh, thank you. How far will you be going? I'm just about to get off. Shinto Micho, is it? I, just as she was about to speak, the conductor came to collect the fare. The woman with the red hair tie took a, out a small billfold from her OB and said in a clear, delicate voice, a transfer to Fukagawa. She's going to Fukagawa too. Transfer at Kayabacho, said the conductor redundantly in a provincial accent. Straight ahead on both sides of the street were, was a series of houses with stylish lattice doors and wooden fences. There were door lanterns made of frosted glass and pine coverings to protect against frost. On the second floor, railings, padded kimono and yukata in rough kihachijo patterned cotton had been set out to dry. Paper lanterns could be seen here and there with the words bird and broiled, written thickly in a semi-cursive style. Suddenly, things opened up brightly on both sides, and the streetcar began climbing up a bridge. On the left side, a similar type of wooden bridge floated in the air. Looking down, one could see the stone wall along the riverbank that extended in a, fair, in a straight line, finally bending at the right angle. The water of the canal, underlying water of the canal, again, a water imagery, so tranquil. So this is uh, the water imagery is among the uh, few, few uh, pos uh, beautiful images described in this work. The water of the canal, so tranquil that one would have thought it was a pond, reflected everything clearly. <coughs> All right, so this uh, uh, transparency versus uh, turgidity right, is a uh, important sort of binary uh, contrast in this uh, dichotomy in this work. The water of the canal so tranquil that one would have thought it was a pond reflected everything clearly. So things that are good reflect everything clearly. Things that are bad and modern and westernized do not reflect things clearly. It seems to be a kind of underlining a theme that runs through this work. From the two-story houses with lattice doors that continued along the riverbank road to the shadows of the black wooden fences topped with old-fashioned bamboo spikes that were visible in front. Old-fashioned bamboo spikes, that's a good sign, right? Old-fashioned is good for in Nagai Kafu and his narrator's minds. It would be just the title, the title hour, the tide is coming. The, wo the woven mat roofs of the moored freighters rose high as they came and went, and the pale smoke from things boiling rose straight up to the windless sky. A woman in a tight-sleeved coat and headband was washing a child's bedpan on the side of a boat. On the far edge of the bridge, the paper door of a storefront could be seen. It had a new, perfectly white lantern with the words boat rental written on it and a reed screen pushed to the side. Beneath the stone wall floated four or five fishing boats arranged in a tidy row without a single plank missing. 
hardly anyone passed by. So the contrast with this with the situation in the city where everything's busy and crowded trains and so forth. Very few, uh, it's kind of a marginal area. It's been uh, almost abandoned in the modern period, but that's uh, a good thing in his view, sort of. Uh, hardly anyone passed by and it might have been after four o'clock already. It was possible to gaze directly at the slanting sun without being dazzled. So when you're in the middle of the city, in the center of the modern city, it's impossible to look at the sun without uh, it uh, overwhelming you. Here, however, the sun seems more subdued, the sunlight more subdued, slanting sun, without being dazzled. dazzled. The strong yellowish light of the red setting sun shone down, and as one looked out from this angle, the houses, the canal, and the stone wall all became extremely vivid in profile. Okay, so evening is, has come, is coming. Or approaching evening, things have taken on this kind of uh, this beautiful uh, t uh, tone, color tone. Yet the indefiniteness of the Japanese air did not add the slightest hint of light and shade to make it possible to discern the distance. Faced with this view of the canal, one could not help but think of the background of an old-fashioned play. Okay, so he sees this uh, scene, and he's reminded of the uh, old theater of the Edo period, right? The uh, Kabuki theater, the Jōruri puppet theater of Chikamatsu, and so forth. It seemed all too appropriate, appropriate to me now, and I recalled completely the dramas of Mokuami, Hodanji, and Kikugoro, the boat rental, the red, the reed screen, those bamboo spikes. So these are all kind of leftovers from the past. At that mo very moment, we passed by a theater with walls covered in a white grid pattern. Sintomichi announced the conductor. One of the women with the chignon got up from her seat. Well then, if you'll excuse me, please stop by sometime. Yes, of course, whenever you're free. Goodbye. The streetcar crossed Sakura Bridge. The canal was much wider than before, and the boats appeared to be coming and going in a hurry. But the boat, small houses and shops with their pine decorations appeared narrower and poorer than those in Tsukiji. Crowds of people walked along, all jumbled together. We stopped at Sakamoto Park and even... After waiting there for some time, it, did, it still didn't appear as though we would depart. The streetcars ahead and behind had come to a stop too. The driver and the conductor seemed to have gone off somewhere. Screwed again, another powder outage, I'll bet. A merchant in a silk woven coat and leather sandals looked over at his companion, an old man with a full fur muffler and a flushed face. A shop boy, balancing a light green package on his head, promptly jumped up. Wow, it's a whole line of streetcars, he cried out. You can't even see where it ends. The driver came hurrying back, carrying a bag under his arm, <clears throat> his hat pushed back on his sweaty head. My sincere apologies. Will all transferring passengers kindly disembark here? As soon as they heard this, most of the passengers immediately got up from their seats. One man pursed his lips in displeasure. What's going on? Won't this take an awfully long time? I'm terribly sorry. This way, please. The road continues on to Kayabacho. The beautiful woman with the chignon was the last passenger to get off the streetcar carrying the silk wrap parcel that might have been a gift box of chocolates. Okay, that's the end of part one. Let's see if he follows this beautiful woman into Gaga and uh, kind of stalks her as he is wont to do as a slanderer. Um, section two. Read it as quickly as possible. We have 20 minutes before I have to take daughter to kindergarten. As I have already mentioned, I wasn't going anywhere in particular. Enticed by the commotion of the crowd getting off, I casually got up from my seat. The conductor, without even being asked, gave me a transfer ticket to Fukagawa. So he just immediately knows from the, uh, <coughs> the uh, sort of atmosphere the, that he gives off, uh, from the aura he gives off that he's on his way to Fukagawa. <coughs> the conductor knows. The streetcar, which was painted reddish-brown, continued for a good two or three blocks along the thoroughfare, cut off from the sun by the roofs of the houses. Rays of sunlight shone down at an angle onto the main street in Kayabacho, and several western-style buildings of uneven height stood on the opposite corner. They were all roofs and windows unadorned by even a single carving. Indeed, they looked like flimsy storage sheds, lacking all thickness and weight. Above the thoroughfare, a tangled web of electric wires obstructed the view of the clear winter sky. The wooden logs of the telephone poles, which looked like they had been cut down from the mountains just yesterday, st stuck up so unapologetically that it was impossible to see ahead. So even in this beautiful uh, Fukagawa area, it's kind of the last remaining uh, vestige of the old city of Edo, 
uh, it's, it's in the process of being colonized by modernity, if you will. On them were smeared advertisements, all these disgusting modern things, vulgar things like advertisements painted in, painted in offensive colors without regard for the art of design. Nobody cares about aesthetics anymore. Each household had set out flags and banners of nationalism, right? This idea of the nation is something that's uh, disgusting to the Edo sensibility, uh, the poet's sensibility. Each household had set out flags and banners amidst the decorations of dirty bamboo leaves and withered pine, but they had chosen only extremely simple colors for all of them, like purple and red. With anger, I thought back to the Fukagawa of old. Okay, so he's looking at this uh, new modern Fukagawa, and he compares it unfavorably to the Fukagawa at old that he experienced and uh, still remembers from his childhood before he went to uh, America in the West. Fortunately, I had the transfer ticket in my hand. I was seized by a desire to flee to Fukagawa. I would go to Fukagawa, leaving behind this wretched city in a single bound. Many years before, now here's the recollection that he gives of his uh, trip to, uh, of his life before uh, leaving Japan. Many years ago, before I left Japan, watery Fukagawa. Okay, again, watery. Remember this uh, old Edo, the city of Edo was like uh, Venice. Watery Fukagawa was for a long time a place that satisfied all my deep emotions, curiosity, ecstasy, sadness, and pleasure. And pleasure, of course, he means erotic pleasures, which is uh, absolutely central to the works of Nagai Kafe. Uh, the street cars were not yet in operation. This is before westernization, before modernization, but already the beautiful views of the city of Tokyo were being destroyed completely. So even then, the process had begun. Crossing over the river, when I beheld the slightly sad, lonely back streets of that district on the outskirts of the city, I experienced the simple, perfectly harmonious beauty of the worn out and the decaying, a beauty that cannot be described. Okay, so there's a kind of ambiguity in Nagai Kappa's works of uh, the object of this nostalgia. Is the object of the nostalgia this past city, or is it his own childhood? Right? So it might just be his childhood, his longing for the days of his youth uh, before becoming an adult. They're kind of mixed together, right? This nostalgia for childhood and the nostalgia for this uh, lost city, the city uh, that, that is no more, the, the Japan that is no more. In those days, there wasn't the convenience of a streetcar from the prosperous city center to Fukagawa. Right? So, uh, today, he rode the, city, uh, the streetcar from Yamanote, the city center, center of modern Tokyo, straight to Fukagawa, but back then you couldn't do it on a streetcar. The rickshaw fare was expensive. And Eitai Bridge, right? Eitai Bashi is one of the uh, main bridges that crossed from one side of the Sumiragawa to the other side. And Eitai Bashi, Eitai Bridge, had been under construction for I don't know how many years. Traffic in the neighborhood was restricted by bamboo enclosures, right? So no, no street signs, no uh, street traffic lights, and the area was so rough with pebbles and gravel that hadn't been paved yet that no carriages could get through. And so everyone would board small diesel steamboats departing from Shiodome and passing along the canal at Sanjikengbori, or else they would take a rowboat from the riverbank at Minami Hachobori. The boatman would ring his bell like a tofu vendor and call out, we're leaving, we're leaving, well before departing. As the boat made its way along the Echizen Canal, Ishikawa, Ishikawa Jima would come into view in the distance, and at last the boat would traverse the lower reaches of the river at Eitai Bridge. Okay, so even today, you can take these boats that go start at the top of Sumiraga and go down uh, the river. Buffeted by, so you can uh, read this work uh, as you ride uh, down that river. Uh, down the river on the boat, if you ever have the chance. Buffeted by the waves of the ebb tide and the flood tide, it was almost like crossing the Indian Ocean before the boat finally entered the canal that runs from Echujima to Hamaguricho. It was just past noon on the third day of celebration in honor of Fudo, so the Buddhist uh, deity Fudo, and people were returning from their temple visits with all kinds of toys in their hands, such as shuttlecocks for battle door, shrine tokens known as Mayudama, Narita-san Narita -san paper lanterns, and Sumiyoshi dancing dolls made of clay. clay. So these are in the early years, the middle years of the Meiji period, when uh, people still had celebrations for Buddhist deities like Fudo, right? I don't think you would see much of this in uh, 
the latter part of Meiji, right? Because Buddhism was kind of pushed to the uh, margins uh, in their process of modernization, and Shinto was rise, risen to uh, established as a, as a uh, state religion. Lo Icho Gaishi, so underline the hairstyle again, Lo Icho Gaishi hairstyles mingled with the heads of men in workmen's coats with the insignia emblazoned on the back. Sound of the oars of several fast-moving rowboats all struck in rhythm, and voices came from among the moored boats flowing along with the peaceful tide. How picturesque it must have been for those who leaned against the railing of the rotting wooden bridge with its signboards prohibiting vehicular traffic as they looked out over the people's colorful clothes, toys, and lanterns reflected in the waters below. Okay. So one thing you could do for an assignment is to write uh, this old world that he's describing and recalling here that he experienced as a young man or young boy or as a boy, probably, and the Fukagawa or uh, Fukagawa that he's uh, experiencing now, right? Colorful. Back then it was colorful, right? Now there are only two colors you just mentioned in a previous paragraph, right? Purple and red. Uh, aesthetic value is no longer as important as it once was. And you can make a list of all the attributes of the old Fukaga contrasted with the attributes of uh, the current uh, Fukaga and then extrapolate that from that uh, dis distinction, his uh, critique of modernity. I will also never forget seeing the Susaki Red Light District while plying the waters by a boat late at night in midsummer, that time of year when hanging lanterns are displayed. Dull fire light, firelight shone out through the shade of rush matting, illuminating the unclothed boatmen who were getting drunk on sake and quarreling. Right? So people could still run around naked and drink sake back in those glorious days. The song of a geisha could be heard from the second floor of a peaceful restaurant lit by firelight, and in the garden an old pine tree extended its branches from the bamboo spikes of the flood gate out of the water. Okay, song of a geisha could be heard, uh, old pine uh, tree, the moon was out, so something like uh, an, a, a scene as, uh, taken from antiquity, right? A shinai balladeer made his way along the riverbank in total darkness through the shadows cast by the storehouse roofs. A carriage with paper lanterns ran across the wooden bridge, its reflection shimmering in the water below. Again, the reflection shimmering in the water image. Faced with such sights, I felt an inexpressible sense of beauty and sadness. Right? So that's how he felt back then. And he's recalling these uh, feelings that it, it the scene evoked in him back then. I was a young man in those days, and I wanted only to give voice to my heartfelt poetic sentiments. I did not know anguish. Blissfully, satisfied by the pastimes of Edo, my heart was truly at peace. So this is kind of song of innocence versus song of experience kind of thing, if you want to put it in Blakeian terms. I thought that the arts of the Ken Yusha were splendid and new. Underline the Ken Yusha group, uh, which... Uh, kind of dominated the literary scene, the bundan of the 18, late 1880s and late and 1890s in Meiji Japan. And Nagaikafu, I think he started his career sort of associated with this group. I thought that the arts of the Ken Yusha were splendid and new. And the Ken Yusha was kind of a revolt against modernity in some ways, right? They rejected all the new styles and the Western imitation that was uh, taking place at the time. And they said, let's turn to Ihara Saikaku and the great writers of the Edo period, right? So this is kind of a Ken Yusha was the first of the Edo revivalist movements. I thought that the arts of the Ken Yusha were splendid and new. I was content with the tumult of emotions expressed in the writings left behind by Chikamatsu and Saikaku. So this is Chikamatsu Monzaimon, right, the great Jōrori uh, puppet uh, drama writer whose works, uh, several plays we've already read in this class. Uh, review those if you have, if you uh, are interested. Uh, I have several videos on those. You can check. Uh, Google, uh, or do a search in my YouTube page for those. And Saikaku, Ihara Saikaku was the great uh, <coughs> Yomi, Yomi, not Yomi, uh, uh, Gesaku fiction writer of the Edo period as well. Um, so I was content with the tumult of emotions expressed in the writings left behind by Chikamatsu and Saikaku. The oscillation of sound waves, the shades of color, the weight of the air, such things had not, stim not yet stimulated my senses in the slightest. I had no inkling that such things could enter the artistic realm. I believed without a doubt that I would live in Japan forever and that I would freely express my feelings in Japanese forever. Right? 
So this is, he's recalling his young self that uh, thinks that he will uh, be sort of existing only in this Japanese context, so in the sort of Sino-Japanese cultural context for the rest of his life and express himself in that language for the rest of his life. But all of that is thrown into a, um, a chaos when he, when he is confronted with the West and when he goes abroad and studies abroad and starts reading French writers and so forth. Right. So he's remember, remembering this old, former uh, pre-Westernized self here, nostalgically. Now I have grown a mustache, so now he's Western, and I am wearing Western clothes, riding on an electric railway, rather than a, a jinriksha. I cross an Eitai bridge, the Eitai bashi, that crosses the, uh, traverses the uh, Sumida River, made of steel, rather than, than the old uh, wooden bridges. How can I not feel the rapid change of the era? Like dazzling smoke, the setting sun obscured the view far beyond the Echizen Canal, which was crowded with freighters and masts. On the near side of Ishikawa Jima, which loomed darkly like a shadow, the sides of several moored sailboats were colored by the red sunlight. Coal smoke rose from beneath the bridge, and as it drifted over the bridge, at times it was impossible to see ahead. This view alone was unchanged from before. They found the one thing that's unchanged from before. But immediately my eyes were startled by the sight of the long bridge extending from Skudajima to Fukagawa. The small row of pines above the embankment and even the figures on the bridge appeared clearly like in a painting. Right? So Fukagawa comes to him like a ukiyo painting, right? And he sees these uh, figures in the distance. I got off the streetcar on the far side of Eitai Bridge, the main street of Fukagawa. I once knew almost this entire row of houses. There was an alluring woman at a clam shop on the corner. So he's recalling this woman that he knew, and by no, he might mean she was a former lover. Um, and what might have become of the young woman at that famous rice cracker shop? So possibly another lover that he's recalling who lived in this Fukagawa area. Trying to recall the memories of my 20-year-old self that had disappeared without a trace, I walked along, looking around restlessly. Right, so again, this ambiguity. Is he looking for the old world of Fukagawa? Uh, is that the purpose of his trip? Or is it to look for his old self, to rediscover his old self? Right? And it's, the answer is probably both. Of course, there was no reason for me to expect to see those women. Yet Fukagawa's tram, uh, main street, Fukagawa's main street was just as deprived of sunlight as it had been before. And strangely, it was only this place that seemed a bit chilly. While there had been no wind in the city center, here the bamboo leaves of the pine decorations rustled. So it's a different world altogether. The, the wind blows differently in this different uh, realm, right? That is, exists almost outside of time, like in the, uh, the Chinese S, uh, story that we read. The single solitary banner of the Fukagawa Theater, which I knew so well, was standing at the corner of the side street just as before. I almost failed to notice that the streets had been widened and my heart was transported completely back to the nostalgic past of 10 years ago. Right, so now he is reunited with his uh, self from 10 years ago. He's entered that past world. I have forgotten the name completely. Unable to remember, I crossed a wood plank bridge and then turned left into a side street where some hand cloths were hanging like banners. A combination of dark blue, black, and orange drew one's attention in this colorless town on the outskirts of the city. Recalling that there was a well-known temple to Fudo in Fukaga, I set off in that direction. In front of a stone bridge spanning a small ditch, I entered an iron gate on which Inner Temple New Yoshiwara Association was written in gold letters. Underline Yoshiwara, Yoshiwara is of course the central uh, red light district of the Edo period, and a new Yoshiwara was uh, made in sometime in the middle of the Edo period, I think, and he's walking through that area now. Straight ahead, the curtains of tea houses, chaya, right? And tea houses in Japanese, of course, uh, means not only tea houses, but the traditional ones that often had uh, prostitutes or geisha uh, entertaining customers there as well. Straight ahead, the curtains of tea houses were lined up along both sides of a stone pathway. Further ahead, in a slightly elevated place at the top of a flight of stone steps, the roof of the main temple rose darkly, absorbing the rays of the setting sun. At the foot of the stone steps were a, where a few temple goers at a time ascended and descended, several stalls had been set out, including a fortune teller and a shuttlecock vendor. A large crowd was standing nearby, among them adults, children, and infants, 
When I got closer to have a look, I found an old man with a shaven head who was striking a wooden fish and chanting a mock sutra, right? Something that you would probably not find in the uh, center of modern Tokyo, right? This is uh, like an image from the past. Next to him was a blind man with unkempt hair that was gray with dusk. Okay, so underline all these uh, p figures, these people that appear in this part of the story, and we'll contrast them with those that he encountered uh, on, while on the train. He was crouched down, this blind man, bending his small body over a shamisen. Right? So we didn't see any shamisen on the uh, train in the middle part of the city, but we do see so these uh, old traditional instruments here. Several of the returning temple goers, having grown tired of listening to the mock sutra, came over to him and paused. Okay, so people are still reciting Buddhist sutras here. You don't see much of that in the uh, modern part of the city. Re recognizing the sound of their footsteps on the gravel, the blind man took out an old plectrum from his pocket and plucked the strings of the shamisen to test its sound. Then in a low voice that arose from the back of his throat, he began to sing. At autumn night, he drew out the last syllable before taking a breath, his cloudy white eyes wide open. Then he turned up his face, tilting his head at an angle. Night, he sang. His voice was hoarse and he had no feel for the first string of the shamisen. At, and yet, in its melody and rhythm, this was precise Utazawa singing, the kind that one can never hear from the likes of Geisha in the high city. So the Geisha in the high city and the modern city no longer know, uh, remember how to uh, perform this old style. I felt not only nostalgia, but also profound respect as I gazed fixedly at the man's face. He was not particularly old. He must have been born in the Meiji period. For no reason at all, I had the feeling that this man had not been born blind, Blind. In primary school, he would have studied things like geography and arithmetic, and depending on the circumstances, he might have learned the very rudiments of the English language under the, formary, under the former primary school system. Yet he would have been unable to reconcile his fondness for the traditional pastimes of Edo with the vulgar and unrefined Meiji administer, administered by those common samurai from Kyushu. Okay, so remember, the common samurai from Kyushu came up and toppled the old Tokuga Bakufu and uh, inaugurated the Meiji period in the, uh, Japan's project of modernization and westernization, right? And Nagai Kafu, of course, looks down on these people who toppled the old world. He must have lost his inheritance and gone blind. Having fallen into pitiable circumstances, he would have had to rely on his artistry that embodied the halfway fashionable ideal of the glorious past, right? So he's a true edoko who's been marginalized in this new modern world. And he's very similar to the uh, poet and uh, protagonist of Nagai Kafu's story, Sumidaga, and that character's name is Dangetsu, I think, if I remember correctly. And this is sort of, uh, we're seeing Dangetsu or Dangetsu-like character appearing here in this story. He must have lost his inheritance and gone blind. Having fallen into pit pitiable circumstances, he would have had to rely on the, his artistry that embodied the halfway fashionable idea of ideal of the glorious past. And those eyes, intoxicated long ago by crowded theater tea rooms, scarlet rugs and tatami rehearsal rooms, festival lanterns and flower adorned conical, conical hats, would have been ex extinguished forever. Still, he would not have known the misfortune of looking upon those wretched streetcars and electrical lines, or those flimsy Western-style buildings. So he's blind, but it's probably a good thing that he went blind. Uh, it's better to go blind than to have to witness what is happening to Japan, is what is the implication of this part, right? And if he did, a true Edoite, a true Edoko, like him, would never feel the same intense disgust and anger that we people of the modern era experience. Unlike us, he would not cling to attachment tormented by a frustration that is impossible to resolve. So again, the Buddhist uh, uh, theme or notion of attachment running through this Buddhist uh, element in this story, uh, which had uh, kind of disappeared in the modern world. The people of Edo soon resign themselves to their circumstances, for they are endowed with the ability to sneer at themselves. Right? This, um, but the modern Meiji people are unable to do this, is what he's saying here. Right? unable to make fun of oneself, unable to uh, experience uh, or to prize levity right, and ludicity. Right? Everybody's so serious in the modern world, serious about 
uh, rising to the top and making money and all the things that modern capitalist people do. The high third string of the shamisen continued to reverberate. As he sang, suddenly the blind man stuck out his head and twisted his face into a grimace. Only the bell reaching this highest of notes, he skillfully employed a falsetto to spare his withered vocal cords. Only the bell, I could have said. Uh, the setting sun shone down through the plum trees, illuminating the face of the blind man. The pitiful shadow, shadow of his crouching body was reflected faintly on the stone wall behind him. On every stone of the wall, the names of the donors were engraved in red. Geisha, entertainers, firefighters, theater ushers, gamblers. None of these names had any relation to the modern era. So he's stumbled upon this completely uh, uh, separate world, this uh, uh, completely detached from everything that is going on in modern Tokyo, just like in the uh, Chinese story. Suddenly I turned around, deep amidst, amidst the plum trees, rising above the low houses outside the park. The dark blue evening clouds hovered like a great wall that filled the western sky. Between them, the setting sun burned red like drops of blood. Color imagery is very important in this. We'll discuss in class uh, all the colors that appear and the lack of colors that appear in some scenes. Uh, the red color was of an astonishing depth. So this kind of depth you don't experience in the uh, modern part of the city, in the high city. But the light was growing dimmer, fading away. All of a sudden, I was struck by a feeling of profound sadness. That sun was setting over the woods of Waseda, Right, so Waseda is uh, in the new part of the city, right, in the Yamanote area, and the hills of Hongo, which is where uh, the University of Tokyo is. How far away I was now, how distant from that Latin quarter of the Orient. The blind man finished his song and immediately continued singing, The Worries of a Late Night Rendezvous. I wish that I could stay here forever and ever. This is the final concluding two paragraphs. I wished that I could stay here forever and ever, bathing in the evening sun of Kagawa, leaning against the stone wall of the temple, that, that superstitious realm of the spirit, and listening to the singing of the Utazawa ballads. I felt an unbearable angst, fuan, in Japanese, right? Anxiety, at the thought of crossing Eitai Bridge to go back. I thought that I would rather perish, like the Meiji-born poet Saito Ryoku, who cherished the memory of Edo. Ah, but instead I must go back. Okay, so despite all this nostalgia, all this reverence and uh, love that he has for the past lost world, uh, nevertheless it is his destiny, his shikume, his fate, to go back and live as a modern man in the modern world and grapple with all these modern problems. Ah, but instead I must go back. That is my destiny to go far away, traversing the river, crossing over the canals, and climbing the hills to the shade of the woods in o Okubo. Right, Okubo is where Nagai Kafa lived for many years, right uh, near Shinjuku. It's Okubo and Shin Okubo. Where a portrait of Wagner sits on, my desk, on the desk of my study, with an open volume of Nietzsche's Zarathustra below it, waiting for me. All right, so his conclusion at the end is... Uh, uh, as much as he loves this old world of Edo and its traditional arts and traditional demimonde and prostitutes and so forth and geisha, he must go to the world of modernity, the world of Wagner and of Nietzsche. But note that the two Western figures that he quotes are uh, figures who in some ways rejected modernity right, and were very critical of it. And he's aligning himself with the modern but with the critics of modernity. All right. That's all. We made it just in time to take daughter to uh, kindergarten. And video did not cut off this time as it did last time. So hopefully the sound will be okay. And we will discuss more about this work uh, in class. I will see you then. Goodbye.